You're listening to Counsel That Cares, a podcast series brought to you by Holland and Knight's Healthcare and Life Sciences team. With more than 400 attorneys practicing across the healthcare industry, members of our healthcare and life sciences team are on the leading edge of industry developments. This series serves as your personal checkup on the multifaceted playing field of healthcare law and business trends. Welcome to Council That Cares. This is Morgan Ribeiro, the host of the podcast and a director in Hahn and Knight's healthcare practice. On today's episode, I am joined by two individuals who spend their days working with hospitals and health systems across the country. First, I'll introduce Rex Bergdorfer, a partner at Juniper Advisory, which is an investment bank that partners with hospitals and health systems as they evaluate their future and execute on their strategic plans. And also joining me is Colin Luke, a partner in Holland and Knight's healthcare regulatory and enforcement group. So welcome to the show, Rex and Colin. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. All right. So on today's episode, clearly based on that introduction, we will be talking about hospital and health systems, but in particular, looking at transactions and what's driving that activity across the country with hospitals and health systems partnering together, looking at acquisitions, looking at a sale. Really want to talk about today the types of deals we expect to see over the coming year and much more related to that topic. So to get us started, you know, as we look back at 2023, we saw an uptick in hospital transactions and industry insiders are expecting more transactions in 2024. In 2023, there were 65 announced hospital mergers and acquisitions, which was up from 53 um, hospital M&A transactions the year before. So Rex, I'd love to start with you just to better understand what's driving this activity, what drove the activity in 2023, and why do we expect to see more of this in 2024? Sure. So maybe just a little historical context on the structure of the industry. There are about 4,000 hospitals in the United States still controlled by over 1,500 hospital companies. So by most measures for industries that are regulated, capital intensive, and complicated, it's still pretty fragmented. And the the numbers you cited on transaction volume, you know, for 50 or so per year to make a dent into 1500, the pace of change is still relatively slow. The median number of transactions that have occurred on an annual basis going back 30 years is more like 85. So I think we're returning to kind of pre-COVID level of activity, motivated more and more by the belief that operating standalone independent hospitals in today's environment is really challenging. And most around the country are undertaking some sort of process to evaluate whether a strategic partnership would advantage their community. Awesome. Yeah. And I think that that's helpful context to really kind of look back at the historical perspective and where we are today. Anything else you would add, Colin, as you're looking at you know, your client engagements and, the, and what's driving some of the um, activity that you're seeing? These are challenging times for hospitals and health systems generally. Rex alluded to some of the major uh, issues about standalone hospitals, but we've seen data breaches. Uh, we've seen ransomware attacks and increasing investments that are necessary for technology. These are huge uh, sums for many independent systems. And then the, couple that with sort of the post-pandemic labor shortages, labor expenses, and uh, the difficulty in attracting and retaining physicians in a, a new era where many physicians are leaving to go to private equity or retiring. Hospitals are absolutely essential for rural communities in particular and for the health and welfare of communities and their citizens, and they've got to survive. And so they've got to evaluate what is it that they can do to make themselves more viable for the future and to provide state-of-the-art health care with limited resources in difficult times. And of course, looking at how they can affiliate more innovative methods of affiliation and still retaining the service of the community is, is absolutely essential for the future for hospitals and health systems. Big change in the market. And I'd compliment attorneys for their creativity in this. You know, an in, in independent hospital used to have kind of two binary options at its disposal. It could 
dig in its heels and try to get more efficient and effective on its own, or it could roll over and become subsumed by the big system down the road. There's been a host of innovation in between those extremes that some of which I suspect we'll talk about today. And that creativity, I think, has caused larger, more proactive participants in change of control transactions. The average size of a hospital seller 15 years ago was about 100 million in revenue. Today, it's more than 800 million in revenue. So people are more forward looking and creative in terms of the types of companies they're seeking to form. Yeah, I think that that's perfect. And, you know, both of you have mentioned this, um, Colin, you know, you mentioned IT expenses and, you know, retirements and sort of that succession planning and kind of the future, both executive nurses, physicians, all that transition that's going on in the labor force. Um, Any other trends that you're seeing as it relates to drivers for health systems that are seeking a partner? I think concerns about uh, AI and how that's going to evolve and then hospital-based physicians and the subsidies that are required for anesthesia providers, for pathology providers, radiology providers, and just making sure you have those areas of coverage, I think are are big drivers. Hospitals are having to say, we are either going to have to spend the money on technology or to pay the subsidy for these hospital-based physicians. And they're thinking uh, if they can affiliate or come up with a a strategy that they're part of a a viable group and some innovative models, perhaps with some uh, physician groups, maybe they can come up with a strategy that works for the future. They're sensing we're on the cusp of rapid change and they've got to be prepared for the future as things develop. That Many payers are also providers these days and have become competitors as well as the uh, chief payer on the commercial side for hospitals. We're seeing direct employer relationships necessitated by that, and that really takes a lot of expertise, keep up with those changes, and you've got to be able to offer value-based care, outcome-based care uh, in order to satisfy those employee groups, and that's hard to do as an independent system. So having economies of scale and greater expertise uh, really helps for the future, and that that's essential for these communities to have those uh, abilities to compete and be viable. Well, I think, Colin, you mentioned something there just about, you know, the payers made me think of this, but just the landscape as we're looking at this 10 years ago versus now and what types of health systems are participating in M&A transactions and why, but even more specifically, what types of systems are acquisitive right now. So maybe, Rex, you can touch on that for a moment and just sort of what you guys are seeing as you're advising hospitals that are looking at kind of what their next steps are. Colin used the word expertise in his last statement, and I I would almost expand that to management bandwidth because operating hospitals has become much more consumer driven. And as consumers now have data on the cost of the care that they're paying for and the outcome that they're paying for, more and more research is correlating quality of outcomes with size and scale. And to do the things that are necessary, like, you know, secure leapfrog ratings, position yourself for what's coming out of Washington, D.C., more management bandwidth is being required than many small systems have. In terms of participants, more and more of our client base of hospitals seeking a partner are um, those sponsored by local governments, cities, counties, districts. So sellers are in an outsized way sponsored by local governments who are concluding that managing a hospital is really difficult to begin with, especially difficult in the sunshine and all the competitive disadvantages associated. Uh, So there's kind of a new group of sellers. There's a new group of buyers too. Many of the academic medical centers that had historically been content being a research only quaternary center in an urban market are now of the belief that they need to form more coordinated geographically dispersed systems. And so they are making acquisitions in a really meaningful way. So new group of sellers are local governments, new group of buyers are academics. And with two new participants like that, that's playing out in an interesting way in today's M&A market. 
Well, and I think as a follow up to that, as we look at the for profits and them being less acquisitive, I mean, why is that? And what does their deal pipeline look like today as opposed to 10 years ago? I think many of them have wanted to focus more on outpatient care, ambulatory care in lieu of the capital intensive acute care health system model. Also thinking there's probably going to be some opportunities in the future to buy things at a lower multiple or more attractive price. And interest rates uh, clearly have an impact on their acquisition modes. They're doing more innovative acquisitions, not just the traditional hospital or health system acquisition. And so it means that uh, I think they're in a typical transaction. Certainly Rex can speak to this fewer uh, potential buyers out there in in a bidding or auction process or developing a suitor or the sale transaction. I think that may ebb and flow and you're seeing more nonprofit systems uh, become uh, acquisitive and creating regional or statewide networks as well as, and I think Rex makes an excellent point, that academic health systems are really trying to have large networks with the tertiary care at the center. And they're compelled in many cases to do it because they may be the buyer, the partner of last resort, and it goes to the mission and the support that they get from the legislature if they're a public institution or just the the outreach that they're trying to do as a a private university. But it's changed uh, and it, it may change again, I'd say the... The emphasis right now is away from hospital and health system acquisitions by for-profit companies and looking at how do we expand our ambulatory care network? How do we um, become more uh, physician-centric or more flexible and we can do the population management opportunities that maybe we couldn't do if we're just operating a health system? And we see that in the numbers. If there are 86 transactions that occur per year 10 years ago, about 40% of those were acquisitions won by for-profit companies. Today, that number is down to less than 9%. So to your point, Colin, the percentage of transactions nationally where for-profits are the acquirer has dropped significantly. Why is that? I think that there are real headwinds in the acute care space for for for-profit companies, you know, not being able to participate in 340B, the cost of capital difference between taxable and tax exempt debt is significant. Not paying sales and property taxes is significant. And when you add all those things together, for-profit companies are, are wise and positioning themselves to do less capital intensive post-acute urgent care things outside kind of the four walls of the hospital. I think there are also some regulatory reasons why it's more difficult for for-profit health systems or investor-owned health systems to acquire not-for-profits or governmental facilities. And that's at both the federal and the state level right now. It's much more difficult than it, it used to be historically. And you're seeing that play out in the number of new for-profit hospital companies formed. There's been a real dearth of those sponsored by private equity companies in the last decade. There have been you know, very, very few. And so the, the number of buyers has declined you know, in, in a process with new in-market strategics kind of picking up the slack. I'd be curious, can you all elaborate on issues that you've mentioned here and sort of the, the trend there? I think both at a state and federal level, we, we are certainly seeing a lot more scrutiny around you know, particularly in market, but I would say that that's kind of across the board that we're seeing just more scrutiny. The biggest area would be antitrust, FTC, DOJ, and that's had a real chilling effect because health systems believe they're going to be subjected to a very lengthy regulatory review and perhaps litigation. They're having to say, is it worth it? And let's avoid the expense of the negative exposure. FTC and DOJ have taken a a much dimmer view of in-market uh, amalgamations or even vertical integrations in different markets. They've uh, spoken out against those. They really don't want to see the consolidation. And I think it's been clear with even some recent pronouncements, they don't like private equity in the healthcare system, particularly, and are taking steps to really reduce that. So that that's had a chilling effect. At the same token, as you alluded to, that the states, uh, particularly uh, some on the, the West Coast and in New England, new procedures adopted that make it much more difficult to do healthcare facility acquisitions. And there's an extensive review process 
Many states have had public hearing requirement, hospital acquisition at criteria, if there's been a conversion from a for-profit to a not-for-profit. And many states' attorneys general have gotten involved, at least in making sure their protections or that they get certain uh, contractual commitments as part of the acquisition. But those are costly for a potential acquirer. Those have a lot of uh, negative repercussions on the deal. And I think it's making... uh, the deal volume uh, go down quite a bit because if you can avoid those things altogether, you're going to uh, have a much more successful and quicker transaction. And there's an ebb and flow in regulation. I think we're at the the apex governmental regulation of, of hospital acquisition. So, yeah. So the two agencies I think you're describing that would kind of classically have purview, Colin. N- number one are the state attorney general and. You're right. Most of their scrutiny in the past was applied to conversion transactions where the tax status of the seller was changing. They're going from a nonprofit to a for-profit and the AG would review the transaction to make sure the terms, the condition, the value, the investment, the protections for employees and the like were fair. Interestingly, because the for-profit sector has declined in activity, we're seeing states AGs, especially in heavily regulated places like you're describing, you know, California, Oregon, New Jersey, Minnesota, those same questions are being posed when two nonprofit companies are coming together too now. So there's an increased scrutiny from an involvement of AGs in transactions where they used to really not play a role. On the FTC front, Maybe one of the reasons that academic medical centers are becoming selected as the buyer of choice more often is their sovereign immunity scrutiny on antitrust grounds. I certainly think that's the case. Now, it's not a blanket exception, but if the legislature has granted them the sovereign immunity and they have the state action immunity, they can do transactions where some of their for-profit competitors or even not-for-profit competitors could not. So it's a leg up and that will save a lot of headache if you can take advantage of one of those exceptions to consummate a transaction. So I think, you know, one of the things as we look at this regulatory landscape, we can expect to see transactions where it involves players from different regions or different markets. That's a trend that we've certainly seen over the last you know year or so. Are there any noteworthy deals? Um, you know, those that are, are fairly unique about the kind of the multi-region transactions, like an Advocate Atrium or a Kaiser Geisinger. You know, as our listeners are thinking about this, what's what's interesting to you all about these arrangements, and and can we expect to see more of them in the near future? I think if you looked at the past configuration of for-profit hospital companies versus nonprofits, it's insightful. The for-profit companies used to have, you know, one hospital in Florida, one in Texas, and one in California, and that was market diversification so that they were not over-reliant on any one regulatory scheme or economy, but they often lacked real uh, scale and density within each of those markets. Contrast that with the nonprofit systems, excluding faith-based companies, almost all were only in one state. Most kind of industry prognosticators think you're going to need attributes of both of those types of organizations to be successful in the future. National know-how and scale, for the reasons we've cited, combined with regional density, especially on some of the the vertical things Colin was talking about, direct to employer contracting, clout relative to payers who in most states have huge pricing power. And so I think the transactions you're describing, Morgan, where systems, especially the nonprofits like Advocate or Atrium, are growing across state lines is important. And the distinction and importance between those state lines is blurring. I would agree with everything that Rex said. We've even seen some divestitures in areas where the seller is not a significant player as far as market share that they want a lot of the potential national operators want to be a leading provider in a market or a region and don't just want a a postage stamp collection. 
they like the regional diversity, but they like to be in an area where they can get economies of scale, where there's referrals, there's concentration of particular specialties, and that they can develop some payer relationships or direct employer contracting that cover a, a region. Healthcare historically has been local. Uh, that's changed and it's maybe become regional, but there's still vast differentiations in payer reimbursement and the extent of managed care or capitation or population health, it varies greatly from geographic region to geographic region. And so how you market your services and and manage your businesses is vastly different. I think with enough scale, you can overcome some of those uh, regional differences, but I don't think anyone wants to be the small facility that is an afterthought in the market unless you have a strategy to, to change that uh, so that you um, are providing something special and something that patients desire in the market. Because patients, as Rex alluded to, have become educated consumers. They're going online. They're willing to travel for uh, health care certainly to the the large town an hour away. And you've got to do things to encourage them to come to your particular facility and to have some brand identity in the market. That's hard to do if you're an outlier. Well, I think along those lines, Colin, that's a good segue into my next question. If you think about brand identity, I think academic medical centers tend to have that kind of brand identity in the larger regional marketplace. And we've noticed an increasing role of the academic medical centers and, you know, mergers and acquisitions and looking at, you know, ways to partner with community hospitals. Rex, maybe you can pick us up on that one. Sure. Combining uh, Colin's last point too, you know, a, a sizable share of the transactions last year were for-profit companies uh, exiting certain markets where they didn't have scale, in many cases, to academics. So CHS, HCA, Prime, Steward, Tenant, all made divestitures of markets they felt they didn't have a meaningful enough position in. And many of those were acquired by academic medical centers, which really were absent from the M&A market 15 years ago. They were content being extremely high quality, you know, downtown ivory tower research oriented institutions and are now of the belief that they need to cover more lives so as to be able to weather bundled payments and accountable care They need to have step down levels of care, of vertical integration. You know, their ICUs in the city are full and uh, it's the highest cost setting. And statistics more and more are showing that outcomes for patients are better when they're treated, you know, in a medically safe way close to home. So can we own and operate community hospitals to keep patients out of the urban centers is a strategy that a lot of academics are pursuing. And Morgan, you mentioned brand identity, and I I think we've seen across the country, if you travel, there's some variation of uh, world-class care right here at home on a billboard that talks about a service line and names an academic medical center. The idea with the connection of that academic center in a rural hospital or suburban hospital, you're getting a level of care that's above what was offered without the affiliation. And the affiliation may be a little more than a licensing agreement. It may be a full-blown acquisition. It could be a service line joint venture. We're seeing all those innovative approaches. But in the eyes of the public, you have elevated care because you've got the teaching hospital, the academic hospital affiliated. And uh, medicine has made a lot of things possible that you can have the world-renowned specialists on standby and connect those rural hospitals in that. They're not going to do that without some sort of affiliation, and it helps with the whole brand identity. But most academic health systems are looking at strategies to expand their footprint, as Rex was talking about. And if they've got attractive costs of capital and uh, leadership that really wants to embrace the idea of expanding the system, they've been pretty successful in uh, affiliation because many boards are comfortable affiliating with an academic medical system as opposed to it just depends on who the other person is that, that's not known in the market as opposed to bringing in a name that may be a great provider, but it's just not well known 
it's reassuring to the board to say we have affiliated with the teaching hospital in this part of the state or this this state and uh, it's a safe choice usually for the board depends a lot on the institution and then the form of the affiliation but we're seeing from very little governance involvement to full blown their subsidiary essentially of the academic health system I think that the evidence too of the the caliber of the brand has become more tangible and it no longer is it just a billboard that you pass on the highway that says we're US News and World Report top 20 and it's kind of intangible when patients go to an academic medical center and they participate in Epic's my chart and their visit is well organized and well documented and the follow-up material that they receive electronically through Epic is outstanding. They then return to their community hospital setting and community hospital boards are saying, well, now we need Epic too, because it's the gold standard and patients love it. And it's been proven to be the best and most comprehensive method of organizing electronic health records. And a a lot of community hospital boards simply don't have financial resources or the management bandwidth to pursue a tool like that. And so as patients start to experience, not just hear about differences, how systems operate uh, a lot of times through IT, that's playing a big role. I'd also say physician recruitment, particularly of new graduates, is playing a role that Many hospitals are struggling attracting sufficient number of physicians, uh, specialists in particular, and they feel like if they have access through an affiliation to an academic health system that has residency program, they're more likely to get future physicians and to have coverage arrangements and may not necessarily be the case because physicians are going to make an independent physician uh, decision. But it gives them a leg up if they're affiliating with a source, ready source of new residents and fellows to come in and help provide that coverage. Yeah, we were working with a state sponsored academic medical center in a rural state. And I heard one of the leaders put it really well. He said, many of our new graduates and uh, others coming out of our GME programs want to live in an urban environment. And there aren't very many rural uh, urban environments in this state. And therefore, we need to have an expanded statewide presence. And the role of the academic medical center in that state has grown from just one site to really believing that they are the safety net provider of last resort for everyone in the whole state. Uh, And so how can they do that through acquisitions or working more closely with community hospitals is really what they're seeking to answer. And yeah, I that's think interesting. legislatures have been more willing to give appropriations to the academic health system, the public academic health system than individual hospitals. And most cities and counties are limited in rural areas on what they can do to support the hospital. So it's an indirect way of helping to support healthcare if you've got this connection with the academic medical center system. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting you talk about the role kind of and how that plays out in the role market. I'm, I'm in Nashville, calling here in Alabama. I certainly see a lot with UAB there, with Vanderbilt, you know, and what they're doing here, which is more of an urban and then kind of suburban and surrounding communities around Nashville. And just, I mean, in the last decade, what they've done here to kind of create different access points and getting really creative and how they go about doing that or partnering with another facility on a children's hospital in a suburban market so people don't have to come into downtown Nashville. So it's, I think we'll, you know, certainly based on this conversation, expect to see more of of that activity here in the near future. You know, I think as we sort of near the end of our conversation, we've talked a lot about trends and kind of the dynamics that are driving this activity in hospital transactions. If you're a, you know, board member or an executive at a hospital listening to this conversation, you know, what should they take away from this as they look at their, you know, next five-year plan or to the future of their their hospital? How should they be thinking about this, this conversation and what's actionable for them? I think we'd encourage them to be proactive and looking at options, never just content with status quo. If the pandemic taught us anything, it, it taught us how important acute care health systems are to the communities because they were the episode, epicenter of COVID care. But looking 
beyond COVID and preparing for the next generation and the, the next healthcare event. Just what are my options? What sort of affiliation would make sense for our institution? How can we maintain the integrity and the quality of our healthcare services? And what are our decision points? You never, as a board member, want to back yourself into a corner where you're being dictated to and you have only one option. So it's being proactive, asking leadership, what are we doing strategically to be thinking about the next 10 years? And should we ask for a company like uh, Juniper to come in and evaluate our options? Does it necessarily mean we're going to sell or affiliate, but just what we can do to make ourselves more viable for the future? And thinking about the big picture items that board members should be thinking about it's not all doom and gloom. Certainly, uh, there are a lot of serious issues, but you can, even in a rural area with limited reimbursement, you can survive and thrive. We've plenty of case studies where that's been the situation, but it's taken great boards and uh, really a lot of future-focused decision-making and investments uh, to position yourselves for the survival in the future and, and to thrive. I think the psychological component of what Colin's describing is, you know, in the 2000s, many of the transactions were in troubled markets that had waited too long and they were entering into transactions out of financial necessity and distress. And today, because this has become so commonplace for the reasons we've discussed, the, the stigma associated with proactively thinking about options has largely been lifted. And so I know Colin and I have participated in a few board sessions, kind of in an educational type context where boards are saying, we really ought to think through with comparative analysis, you know, what are our peers doing to contend with change? What are the pros and cons of different approaches? And I think boards today are more inclined to tee up that sort of conversation. Often it's done in a special retreat type format to initiate the the topic. And, you know, Colin, you, you and I both participated in a number of those. I think as groups are doing that more and more, that spells good things for the number of options that are at their disposal and the the flexibility that they'll have in seeking a partner if that's the direction that they want to choose, or at least making sure they don't repeat the mistakes of the past and wait too long until there are not any options remaining. That's an excellent point. I guess historically too, it's been we're going to stay independent or we're going to affiliate and we're going to give up local governance. I think there are a lot of options now where you can retain a strong measure of local governance and involvement and still have an affiliation. So it's not all or nothing. Maybe, and maybe that's the best for the particular situation, but you can still serve the community's long-term needs and enter into some version of an affiliation. And just if you're doing it from a position of strength ahead of time, and you're not waiting, you're more likely to get those kind of mechanisms that protect the hospital for the long-term. Not to get too technical, but with more of the sellers being sponsored by local governments and with more of the transactions being structured as leases, I think what you're saying is definitely true where there's a continued level of involvement from the board, whether it's an elected board or not, in ways that are probably different than the subsidiary advisory feel good only boards of the past. You definitely can have more contractual protections, more teeth, so to speak. Right. And some of those transactions have resulted in foundations being created that are supporting antigen healthcare and other important healthcare objectives in, in the community. So that's yeah. a trade-off. A lot of things are, are possible. As nonprofit buyers are becoming more commercially savvy and, and therefore reasonable in their approach to transactions, we've worked on a few nonprofit to nonprofit combinations where the buyer contributed, you know, significantly to a foundation in a couple cases, you know, tens of millions of dollars into community foundations, really not dissimilar in the way in which a for-profit would look at an acquisition. And we are seeing, I think Rex alluded to this, just some 
outright conversions where a governmental sponsored entity has converted into a 501c3. And that has a, a lot of opportunities to free yourself from the, the confine, the regulatory confines of a governmental hospital and to pick up some other opportunities through that affiliation. You're sort of out of the politics and that makes sense. And that's another option that people should be looking at strongly if you are a governmental entity. Whether it makes sense or not depends on your individual set of circumstances. Yeah, 30 years ago, there were about 1,300 public hospitals in the United States. Now there are about 900. Uh, that doesn't mean 400 went out of business. That means about 400 did what you're describing, Colin, and became part of multi-hospital systems outside of the auspices of the government. It's a definite trend. Awesome. Well, thank you both for your time today. Great perspective on trends that we're seeing in the industry and excellent points and tips for those that are navigating these exciting yet challenging times. Thank, thank you, Morgan, uh, to you and Colin for hosting. Enjoyed it. Thanks for participating, Rex. You added a lot. Thank you for listening to Council That Cares. For more information on Holland and Knight's healthcare and life sciences team, please visit hklaw.com forward slash healthcare.